So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Northwest Seminar of Mathematical Biology and Data Science. This new seminar series is co-organized by the University of Liverpool, the University of Manchester and Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, today's seminar is hosted by Liverpool John Moores University. So first, let me say a few words about our speaker today. One of the most exciting things I have learned in life is that randomness cannot only make structures become more unordered or even destroy them. No, it can actually generate ordered patterns that wouldn't really appear in the deterministic version of the same model. So that's why I'm proudly wearing my pattern formation shirt today. Here you go. If you haven't seen pattern formation yet, just have a look at my shirt and you know. Our speaker today, Paul Brestov, of course, has been aware of this for a lot longer than me. So I would have loved to invite him for a seminar for quite a while, but this wouldn't have been so easy because he lives in the US. Now, the great thing about virtual seminars is that you can suddenly invite everyone and they might even say yes. So the remaining difficulty is uh, the time difference. So I highly appreciate that Paul agreed to talk at 4 p.m. for us, which is not quite 4 p.m. for him. So it's um, relatively early in the morning. So please let me introduce Paul Breslov. Uh, Paul studied uh, physics in Oxford and did a PhD at King's College in London on a topic in quantum physics, I think super string theory. After a few years at GEC Marconi, he joined Loughborough University, where he was a professor of applied mathematics in the end. Then in 2001, he decided to leave for Salt Lake City in Utah in the US. And as far as I know, the city was founded with the words, this is the place. And I think that it is certainly one of the best known places for mathematical biology. He's also a visiting professor of Oxford University and a fellow of the Institute of Physics, the IMA and SIAM. Finally, let me say that a few years ago, he published a very nice book Stochastic Processes in Cell Biology, and I think that very soon a greatly extended second edition will come out. Please join me in welcoming Paul Breslov. I look forward to his talk. And the talk will be Biological Pattern Formation Beyond Classical Diffusion-Based Morphogenesis. So I think um, there's just one more person to um, admit to the main room. And uh, now I just have to make my slides um, disappear again so that I can open the floor for you, Paul. <laughs> okay. Do I have to um, share my screen again? Yes. Okay. Hi, Manchester and Liverpool. Uh, it's scary what, when one starts getting old because the last time I was up north, so I'm from London and a bit of a, an annoying Londoner. And the last time I was up north, Manchester way was 1984 or something so it's been a long time and I hate flying I have to admit so it's great to be able to visit parts of uh, my home country without having to get on a plane. So what I thought I'd do today is uh, talk about biological pound formation and uh, I slightly changed the title because it's not just about morphogenesis so mechanisms are about morphogenesis and it's one of my main interests at the moment is trying to think about problems inspired by cell biology that go are different from the standard mechanisms that most people are aware of, the Turing instability and act, activate inhibitor systems and diffusion-based morphogenesis. And so rather than giving a long introduction, I thought I'd get straight into it. And um, I'm going to divide this all into three parts, depending on how bored you get, I might not get through to the third one. But I'm going to talk first of all about cytonine based morphogenesis, which is a really exciting area that a lot of people don't know about, uh, which is an alternative diffusion based mechanism for morphogenesis. Then, talk uh, a shorter uh, section on switching diffusions and its role in setting up intracellular protein gradients. Then, if I have time, I'll just give a broad overview of some of the differences that occur when one looks at intracellular pattern formation rather than uh, Turing pattern formation and morphogenesis. If anyone has a question, which isn't rude, please do uh, feel free to interrupt me. All right. So I, I'm going to assume that, I know you come from a lot of different backgrounds, but basically I just briefly mentioned the sort of standard picture that goes back to Lewis Wolpert uh, in, I guess, the 50s or 60s, which is the idea that there's some local source of messenger RNA at some point in the embryo that produces protein that then diffuses 
in the, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the embryo. And as it diffuses, it starts degrading, but more uh, importantly, starts being absorbed by receptors on cell surfaces. And so the net result, I suppose I can use my pen, so this is pretty cool. All right. So uh, let's use blue. Uh, well, not red. Okay. So the basic idea is you have some source here, and this source then produces protein that diffuses, and as it diffuses, its uh, concentration gets less due to absorption by the uh, cells. And so you end up with a continuous profile of morphogen gradient, which is then converted to a discrete uh, spatial pattern of differentiated gene expression. This is often called the French flag model and it has been known for many, many years. And uh, you know, in an undergraduate course in PDEs, you can solve the steady state diffusion equation with degradation. So the equation over here and end up with an exponentially decaying degradation uh, rate, uh, uh, concentration, where the length constant is basically the square root of d over k. There's been a lot of interest by mathematicians and theoreticians about studying different ways of getting these decaying gradients, some of them having an algebraic decay, by taking into account the fact that often degradation depends on the local concentration. But it's not something I want to get into too, too much today. So what I want to talk about is this new mechanism. It's only been around uh, a knowledge of it for about um, 10 years or less. And that is that many, or well, most cells actually, extend these so-called philopedia or uh, uh, cytonemes that are now thought to play a major role in morphogenesis. And I don't think it's that well known um, outside this local community of cytoneme-based research. And so I just showed a picture of micrograph of a bunch of cells extending these guys. They can be up to about 200 microns in length, but they're only uh, tens of nanometers thick. They're made up of actin, and they are basically known to make direct contact with target cells. And so the idea is that these guys can actually make direct contacts with target cells and transport either the uh, ligand or the receptor of the uh, relevant morphogen uh, to different parts of the tissue. And this is quite an amazing uh, discovery. And basically, this, most of the talks can be about the mathematical modeling of this mechanism for morphogen gradient. And I have to say, there's been very little uh, on this, which is good for me, because uh, I can uh, try and push this. OK. So I just want to uh, will be, if I was uh, applying for a grant, I'd of course mention that there's been just a number of papers coming out in the uh, past few uh, months showing that in fact COVID-19, or uh, I call it Trump's disease, uh, COVID-19, um, one mechanism for spreading uh, COVID within a host is now thought to involve extrusions like these uh, cytonemes, philopedial uh, protrusions that transport the, the COVID-19. In fact, with one of my uh, postdocs, I'm uh, trying to develop a disease spread model based on these protrusions, but that's still ongoing. Okay, but getting back to the topic of today, uh, depending on the organism, there are different mechanisms in how uh, contact is made, and we've been modeling all of these. I'm going to focus on the uh, last one, but let me just go through this. In invertebrates, they find that these uh, cytonemes directly contact a target cell. And there's a lot of evidence that there are puncta, puncta that move along the uh, cytonemes, which are thought to be myosin-based motor-driven transport. There's still a debate about whether there's a direct contact onto the uh, cell membrane or whether it's more like a synaptic contact. And we've been looking at the implications of both forms of contact in our model. What I want to talk about today and go into quite a bit of the mathematics of is another mechanism that seems to occur in uh, vertebrates such as the zebrafish, in which these cytonemes seem to stochastically extend and shrink. And then when they find a target cell, they temporarily attach for about 10 minutes, give a burst of morphogen, and then retract. And so if one wants to try and understand how such a mechanism, stochastic mechanism, could generate a morphogen gradient, one has to look at the sort of uh, first passage time problem of how long does it take for one of these guys to find a target and then to ask, well, if you now have many of these events, 
How do you then build up a steady state when you combine it with degradation, distribution of resources across tissue? And that's the goal of, uh, and I'm not sure how long this is going to take, this is going to be the meat of, of the talk today before I get on to other topics. So that's the goal. So now what I want to do is set up a model and then go through the mathematics. And I should say this mathematics is probably, so I, again, I don't know backgrounds of people, but this is a kind of stochastic process, a search process area of mathematics. So if you're kind of thinking that it's going to be some sort of PDE based approach, um, it's not so much. I'm going to emphasize the stochastics and it's a sort of bunch of methods I've been using recently, which I think are very powerful and apply to a lot of problems in uh, mathematical biology and cell biology. So also part of this is to maybe introduce some of you to methods I find useful, whether you will or not, I don't. But let's get to the particular problem. So we have a one source cell. So just as a caveat before uh, anyone who jumps up and down, of course, there'll be many source cells, and many cytomines. But as a first approximation of each one of these growing, shrinking cytomines is independent of the others, I can scale things up using the law of large numbers. So I'm just going to focus on one cytomine and ask what happens to that in terms of finding types. So imagine I have some sort of uh, some tissue and the source cell is sending out one cytomine which moves in a random direction. This is the, at the heart of this. So each time the cytomine nucleates, it shoots out in a particular direction and with a certain probability PI, it's directed towards the ith target. Now you also see a dashed line in the figure. I'm a bit nervous using my pencil because it seemed to crash my system. So I'm just going to uh, describe it in words. So the dashed line represents an, an example of a trial in which the cytomine fails to find any target. And so there's a probability of failure. And so then the question is, so suppose that the cytomine starts growing in a particular direction. It might be in the right direction to find the i target cell, eventually finds it, delivers its stuff, and then retracts. But it might grow in the wrong direction. And so this is a bit of a problem, but there's a big topic now in the statistical physics community of stochastic resetting, in that if the source cell grows in the wrong direction, it's beneficial if there's a certain probability that whatever direction it grows in, it suddenly switches to a retraction phase. And that's actually seen in the biology. And so we have a stochastic setting mechanism in which the cytomine grows in a random direction it goes towards the i target with probability pi, but it also has a probability of switching back to the source cell with some exponentially distributed time uh, with rate r. And we'll take the growth speed to v plus and the uh, retraction speed to v v minus. That's the picture. And it turns out, although this is quite a simple model to describe, the mathematics is pretty integrative, and that's why I want to um, integrate. I want to try and explain in this talk. So any questions about the basic uh, goal of this model? Okay. So uh, let's start writing down some mathematical equations. So uh, at the live, there aren't going to be PDs, but there's not going to be diffusion like PDs. So if you look at the figure on the left-hand side, I'm first considering the case P equals one. So the probability of going to a target is uh, one. So I'm just considering one target for the moment. I'm going to develop the mathematics for this simple problem and then you just state that I can use the same techniques to the more general multi-target problem and just quote results. And so the source cell extrudes a cytomine that grows towards the target at the speed V plus. The target cell and source cell are a distance L from each other, but with a certain probability of rate R, the cytomine can retract and return to the origin with speed V minus. Once it's at the origin, it takes time before it starts nucleating again, that's like a refractory period. And again, that's itself distributed according to some exponential distribution. And then after this refractory period, it repeats the process. If P is less than one, then in certain cases, rather than going towards the target, it goes towards another target or fails to find the target. And you just have to eventually retract and start the process over again. So the left-hand diagram describes graphically the different phases of the model. On the right-hand side, I've written down a PDE system, a hyperbolic PDE system, that describes the uh, evolution of the probability densities. So let me just explain this uh, picture. And again, they look pretty simple equations. So P plus XT is the probability density that at time T, the cytomine has length X and is growing. 
P minus is at time t, it's a position x, but it's in the retraction phase. And P naught is the probability that the particle is in the nucleating state. So if you look at these equations, you have advection terms, which basically have a Liouville equation representing just the deterministic ballistic transport. RP plus means there's a certain exponential rate at which you can switch from the plus state to the minus state. So it's minus RP plus in the first equation and plus RP plus in the second equation. And then P naught can increase because the flux returns the origin, which is V minus P minus at zero but also it can enter the growing phase again, which is the eta p naught t term. And then we have uh, boundary conditions, reflecting boundary conditions uh, at the left-hand side. And if it does succeed in reaching the target, it's absorbed and delivers its uh, morphogy. And I also have a bunch of initial conditions. Okay, so that's the model. And it turns out, that although it's a very instant and simple looking model, it takes a lot of work to analyze this system, and uh, that's what I want to talk about now. First thing to note, again, I, I'm trying to make this as self-contained as possible because I, I guess not all of you work in stochastic processes, but one important quantity is what's the mean first passage time, given that it does definitely move towards the target, that it finds the target. Because it has a probability of resetting, it's a non-trivial calculation, but basically, First of all, if I take these equations and integrate them and uh, sum them, I can quickly show, this is like a conservation equation, the rate of change of the probability in uh, the growth or shrinkage phase, plus the rate of change of the probability in the nucleation phase is balanced by the flux into the target. So that's just a, a flux, a conservation condition. And then one of the important quantities one defines in these sorts of processes is the so-called survival probability. What's the probability at time t I haven't been absorbed by the target? And that's going to be the sum of the total probability that I'm retracting or growing, plus the probability I'm at the nucleation state. And a, a standard result in the, this business is that the first passage time density is given by minus the derivative of the survival probability with respect to time. And based on the first equation, that's equal to the flux into the target. So what I'm interested in is if the probability that I find the target at time t is determined by this first patch time density t, then I can just do an, a standard expectation that the mean time to find the target is the integral of ft t dt, which when on substitution and integration by parts tells me that t is the Laplace transform of my survival probability evaluated at, at s equals zero. And that's, and that's the kind of classical result. And this applies to any search model, but uh, we have a very simple one in this case, and uh, I want to now uh, show you how to calculate T and do other things. And it turns out to be non-trivial. Okay. So this is kind of the most fraught part of the uh, talk if you haven't seen these sorts of things before. So I'll try and go quite slowly because uh, there's a bit of an art to this. But basically, I'm going to exploit the fact, and this is called a renewal method, that suppose I, I'm growing, and then before I reach the target, I shrink back to zero and wait a time before I start growing again. When I start growing again, I have no memory of what's happened before I shrink back to zero. And so I can exploit that and develop essentially an iterative equation to study the first passage time problem. So if you look at um, the picture below and relate it to the things I've defined, curly T is the first passage time, which is the stochastic process. I haven't taken the average yet. It's the first time that I reach the target and absorb. And that time doesn't care how many times I reset. Now let me define a time that says, suppose that it's the first time uh, that I do actually reset for the first time. So if you look at the figure, I'm growing for a while, and then in this particular trial, I reset. And the time for me to get back to the origin is given by S. Once I'm back at the origin, I wait a time tau, which is the nucleation time, and then I start growing again. Now I can grow and shrink many, many times. I've just shown one more time here. But how many times I grow and shrink 
the total remaining time to be, reach the target is called R. And so T is the total time, S plus tau plus R, and S is the time for me to get back to the origin once. If that occurs, tau is the time I rest before I start the search process again. The core idea of this, which applies to many, many problems in stochastic cell biology, is that because I lose memory of previous search processes, the distribution of R is identical to the distribution of the total time tau. So once I'm back and start growing again, it doesn't matter if I've had one resetting or 10 resettings, the time I take on average will be, have the same distribution as when I started at zero. And that's the core idea of the renewal method. So now let's try and apply this to solve the problem at hand. Any questions about that? I mean, that's, that's the main conceptual framework. And the point I want to make is I can generalize this to the case of multiple targets uh, and uh, many other situations. The art of this, if you like, is to work out what are the appropriate sets of conditional first passage times to write down to set this up. And this is about the simplest one I can think of present at this point. Okay. So let's proceed a bit further. I now want to start um, determining my mean by Spanish time by conditioning on various events. So let omega denote the set of events where I eventually find the target. Now, if I set P equals to one, so P here, remember, determines the probability of failure. So if P equals one, I do definitely find the target eventually. So in that case, the set of events has measure one, the probability one. In other situations, it's not. Now let gamma be the set of events where I eventually find the target, but I do reset at least once. It immediately follows that if I take the complementary set, that's the set of all events which the particle is captured without any resetting, which is the simplest case. I just go boom, straight to the target, end of story. The other aspect of this method, once you've defined these various first passage signs, is to introduce a decomposition. So, and the way to think about this is that you've got a whole bunch of random events, and basically you're going to partition the events into subsets and then it take expectation with these subsets. And so there are two possibilities. Either I hit the target without any resetting, which is the first term on the right-hand side of the middle equation. So one here is just an indicator function that says that this is just conditions on the fact I don't reset at all. And the other contribution is I do reset at least once. Once I do that, I can then use the information I have about the model to solve these expectations. And so let me just go through this. If I don't reset at all, I just deterministically move at speed V plus, cover a length L, and then get the target. So the survival probability is just a heaviside function of L over V plus minus T. But I also have to take account the fact that I'm conditioning on not resetting. And that's given by the cumulative probability distribution, E to the minus RT, where R is the rate of reset. So if I combine these, I can then evaluate the expectation, the first expectation of, of the middle equation, by just integrating t over the effective probability distribution. And then just with a bit of uh, uh, manipulation, you can show using theory of Laplace transforms that this expectation is just one plus r d by dr of the Laplace transform of this cumulative, which is very easy to evaluate. So that's the first um, term. And then the second term it, it takes a bit more work, but you can basically now say, well, what contributes to T if I do reset at least once? Well, it's this set of events, S plus tau plus R. And so I break it up into those three guys, and then I can show that the second two terms are just the mean time to nucleate plus the mean first passion time. So remember, I said that R has the same distribution as the original tau, T, curly T, so what I end up with is an expectation of S given that I reset once, plus the mean nucleation time, plus the mean first passion time I want to calculate times the probability that I reset once. I can then use similar arguments to uh, talk, calculate E 
I don't want to go through all the details, but basically you can now calculate every term in this equation using the information I have. And rather than going through all the details, let me get to the main point. What you can do is you can evaluate all of these terms using this conditioning and uh, uh, decomposition, and you end up with an implicit equation for the mean first batch time. This is exactly the renewal process. Where remember, Q0 tilde R is the Laplace transform of the survival probability without any resetting. By rearranging the equation, I end up with the middle equation, which is the uh, main result. So you can see that although it's a very innocent system, let me go back, hopefully I don't induce any seizures. So you have these three first order PDEs, well, two PDEs and an ODE. And all I want to do is work out well, what's the mean time for me to find the target. But in order to do that, and take into account the fact that I can reset, I have to take account of the different possible events that occur and decompose them, carry out some uh, Laplace transforms, and then ultimately I end up with this explicit equation. It turns out that although I'm using this very simple model of if I don't reset, I just move deterministically, I could replace that motion by Brownian motion or some other stochastic model, these methods would still apply. And this is the whole topic of stochastic resetting. What's the effect of randomly resetting back to your initial position on a search process? So this is an explicit, nice example of a general theory. If I plug in my particular formula for the Laplace transform of the spiral probability at the bottom of this page, I then get this explicit equation. So I found in my own research, which doesn't mean it's going to be interesting to you, but this is a very powerful method for solving a lot of quite complicated problems where you have to keep track of a number of different events together with this renewal idea. So rather than now uh, boring you with more complicated examples, I'm just going to state that this method applies to much more complicated situations. So for example, Suppose I now allow for the possibility of failure. I can use the same method. I have to introduce more uh, different types of first passage times to keep track of the different events. But I can summarize them in the diagram at the top. So suppose I start growing, then I have two possibilities. Either I grow all the way to the target, end of story, or I go back because I retract to the nucleation site then I could repeat the whole process. If you look at the right-hand side of that figure, that's for P equals one, that's all that occurs, and that's why I've analyzed so far. But if P is less than one, each time I return to the origin, there's a possibility that the next time I shoot off in the wrong direction. Then I have some distribution of times it takes before I return to the origin, and then I repeat the process. So now I have to take into account what's happening on the left-hand side of that figure. But you can do it. You go through all, you turn the machinery, as I've talked about in the, uh, this uh, part of the lecture, and you can write down an explicit formula for the mean time to find the target given the probability of error. And so this extra term inside the curly brackets, the first term in the, inside the curly brackets, takes into account the fact that I can fail. Now, if you then plot this for various parameter values, this is one of the main things that's exciting people in stochastic resetting. It turns out that you can optimize, i.e. minimize the time it takes to find the target by varying the resetting rate. And this is a characteristic feature of stochastic processes with resetting. So I've just plotted the mean first passage time as a function of the resetting rate for different lengths, distances between target and source cell, and for different probabilities p. And for a wide range of parameters, you'll see as indicated by the green dots, that there exists an optimal resetting rate that minimizes the mean first passage time. So that's a characteristic feature of these processes. Even better, I can extend this method to multiple targets. And if the mathematics or the, well, the calculations get really horrible, and I don't want to kind of uh, write all this down on, in a talk, but all I want to indicate are the steps. So now I have to take into account that I can uh, find different targets. So I'm going to define tau j sorry, to be the time that I first find the j target, which is the distance lj from the source cell. And if tau j equals infinity, that means I didn't find that target, I found a different target. I can then introduce the set of events that the particle finds the j target, 
which is omega j. But now I have to be a bit careful because in the previous case, with resetting, I do eventually find the single target. In the case that I have multiple targets, there's a less than one probability that I'll find any given target. And you can take that into account by defining what's called the splitting probability. So power pi j is the probability that when I do find a target, it's the j form. And you can actually calculate that very easily. And it involves these probabilities pj and these exponentials involving the resetting rate, the distance between the j target and the source cell, and the growth speed. More complicated, and that's why I didn't want to write down, is I can also then determine, given that I find the J to target, how long does it take? And that's called a conditional first passage this time. I have to condition, because if I don't condition on finding the J to target, the mean first passage of time will be infinite, because there'll be contributions from trajectories that find another target. But anyway, I can do all that and I can calculate everything using the methods I've talked about in uh, this part of the lecture. So let's go a bit further. So the other aspect of this, which um, is, I think, very interesting and important, and uh, some of you probably work in population biology, ecology, one of the emphases in many pr uh, applications to search processes, and I, I say that it's a kind of search-centric process in which you're interested in the organism, the animal, searching for food or shelter, and once it finds the target, it grabs its resources, and that's the end of the story. In cell biology, it's often very different, that it's really a target-centric process where what we're really interested in is the target cell and the target cell building up resources over multiple rounds of uh, delivery of cargo or morphogen. And so this is what I try to show in this picture, again, for a single target. What I'm now doing is I'm allowing for multiple search and capture events. So what I've talked about so far is just a single event where this uh, cytosine grows and shrinks and eventually bang, hits the target and delivers a burst of morphogen. Now suppose once it's delivered its morphogen, it shrinks back to the source cell, is reloaded with morphogen and starts another search and capture event. This is the, the process that's gonna build up resources in a target cell. So I've shown you this here, that it grows, eventually it delivers uh, cargo, then it shrinks back renucleates and then goes off in another direction. But over many, many uh, events, it eventually builds up resources in each time. Of course, in practice, there'll be multiple sightings doing the same thing. But again, as I said, if they're independent, I can carry over the statistics of a single sighting to the end sighting input. And so from the perspective of the target cell in this target centric picture, what's happening is it keeps building up morphogen through these bursts there's also going to be natural degradation. So over time, one expects there to build up a steady state level of morphogen. And so this is now how I relate this uh, quite unusual um, stochastic search and delivery process to morphogenesis. And it turns out that one can analyze this by using queuing theory. Now again, I, I don't expect uh, people to know much about or anything about queuing theory. I'm just making the conceptual link. So in queuing theory, one's interested in uh, a statistical arrival of a batch of customers that are in a queue. They're a one or infinite or a finite number of servers that serve each member of the queue. And once a, a customer has been serviced, it exits. This is directly mathematically equivalent to what I've been talking about, where the uh, morphogen burst, if you like, is the arrival of a customer. This leads to accumulation of morphogen in the cell, which you can think of as the server or infinite number of servers, and each morphogen burst can degrade, which is like being successfully served and then exiting. And so there's a direct parallel between these multiple rounds of search and capture to build up a morphogen gradient and queuing theory. And we have exploited that to actually solve the problem of determining the morphogen gradient in applications. And so uh, it turns out to be a particular sort of um, queuing uh, model, which I don't want to go into the details of, but basically um, you can characterize, so the link between the first half of this talk and queuing theory is uh, 
that the arrival of the customers, i.e. the morphogens, is described by the first passage time density for a single search and capture event, which I analyzed in the first half of this talk. And so I can now import that into this queuing model, and I'm just gonna summarize the results. There's several pages of calculation, but you can use standard methods in queuing theory, but the important thing, what are the results? At steady state, where you have this combination of multiple events of delivery of morphogen with degradation, you find that the steady state number of morphogen packets in the kth cell is the splitting probability pi k that I can calculate in the first half of the talk, divided by the so-called unconditional probability t, which is just weighted sum of these conditional probability times, gamma, which is the degradation rate, and tau cap, which is an extra thing that when it uh, loads up with new resources, that takes time. I can also do other things, which I'm not going to talk about uh, in, in this lecture. I can calculate the variance of this and statistics. So I can actually look at the effects of noise, because it's a stochastic process, on the morphogen gradient profile. But the main point is, by combining this theory of stochastic process in the first half of the talk, with queuing theory, I can work out the steady state accumulation, the statistics of the steady state accumulation of resources in a bunch of target cells in tissue. And so M bar K is the deterministic, the mean distribution of morphogen across a bunch of cells. So that was the main thing. So you can see it's very different from solving the steady state diffusion equation with degradation to get a, a morphogen gradient. But the nice thing is, you end up with things that look a bit like you get from diffusion. So again, I want to get onto some other topics. So I'm just going to briefly sketch the idea. So let's imagine that I have a one dimensional array of target cells. I could also do two dimensions or multiple layers. And now I can use trigonometry and geometric factors to actually calculate the probability that if the cytosine each time grows in a random direction, say from naught to pi over two, What's the probability that it grows in an angle that subtends one of the target cells? I won't bore you with details, we can just use very simple trigonometric arguments to get a direct formula for the probability PK that goes into all of the stuff I've done so far. And the final point I want to make in this part of the talk is you can then plot, based on your model, morphogen gradients. So as I mentioned, the mean number of morphogen in the case target cell is proportional to the splitting, pro splitting probability pi k. I can now calculate everything and lo and behold, you get a morphogen gradient as a function of the target cell. This morphogen gradient depends on the parameters of the model, in particular resetting rate. So the resetting rate, the rate at which it retracts, carves the shape of the morphogen gradient. Moreover, I can also ask about, well, what's the total amount of steady state morphogen delivered in the tissue? And that's given by M tot, which is basically the one over T plus tau kappa in the, the bottom. So I can calculate everything based on this uh, theory. And one final point, note that the amount of stuff delivered to the tissue is itself uh, optimized by a particular resetting rate. There's a resetting rate at which you'll get the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak. Okay. As I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, part of the talk, which is the main part of the talk, I can extend this to multiple cytonemes, which could either be due to the fact I have multiple nucleation sites on the same cell, or of course I have a cluster of source cells, each with one or two or more cytonemes. This is a more difficult problem, but if you assume independence of the cytonemes and that the source cells are clustered locally, many of the results I talked about in this lecture can be carried out. Okay, so that is kind of the more, more detailed problem I wanted to talk about. In the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about something else. So I think. Um, Switching diffusions and protein grains. I'm, I'm just, I, I want to get on to the third topic. So I'm just going to brief, briefly just tell you that there's a very interesting process that it goes within individual cells. So just to briefly mention, when you look at rather than tissue, but intracellular protein concentration gradients, you have very different mechanisms. 
The notion of protein degradation and so forth that applies to morphogenesis doesn't give you the right time and length scales for these sorts of problems. So what you tend to have instead is localized sites of phosphorylation of your molecule. And then as the molecule diffuses inside the cell, it's dephosphorylated by deactivating enzymes. And so you end up with a concentration gradient of phosphorylation, and that's thought to play an important role in many aspects of cell division and so forth. What I just want to briefly mention is there's a, an even more interesting mechanism for setting up more uh, protein gradients inside cells based on this idea that depending on where you are in the cell, the switching between, you can switch between slow and fast diffusion. This is really cool mechanism where molecules can actually be in two states, one in which they diffuse slowly and one in which they diffuse quickly. Now, if things are such that a molecule diffuses slowly on the left-hand side, quickly on the right-hand side, you can very quickly show this will lead to a protein concentration gradient. I just mentioned this because, uh, uh, and there's a lot of data to show that, that uh, I, with my colleague Sean Lawley, a year before this experimental data came out, proposed exactly this mechanism in which you have a Brownian particle diffusing and switching between fast and slow diffusion and did the analysis. And uh, so the experimental paper doesn't do any analysis. And we did this a year before. We submitted it to PhysRev Letters, but they said it was too speculative. So timing is everything in this game because it turned out that this preceded what something that seems to be found in, uh, in nature. And basically you can uh, do the analysis and reproduce their results. But uh, that's just kind of a brief mention of an interesting mechanism of spatially heterogeneous switching between different rates of diffusion. What I want to do in the last five, 10 minutes is take a complete change of track because I wanted to, I mean, the main part of this point of this talk is to show you there's a lot of really cool things out there that are not your standard mechanisms for pattern formation. I've talked about gradients rather than spatially periodic patterns, so I want to end by talking about that. And uh, I think you've got the Alan Turing Institute in Manchester, so it's uh, appetite to talk about this. So Alan Turing, as you all know, came up with this beautiful mechanism, the counterintuitive mechanism for setting up spatially periodic patterns by having a slowly diffusing activator and a quickly diffusing inhibitor. So although the intuition was that diffusion tends to spread things out uniformly, when you include nonlinear chemical reactions, you can end up with spatially periodic patterns emerging. And the idea is that the fluctuations of a uniform state uh, can be decomposed into different Fourier components. And if the uniform perturbation is uh, it's stable to uniform perturbations, but unstable to spatially periodic perturbations, you get the emergence of a spatially periodic pattern. So that hopefully everyone's familiar with that. It turns out that in intracellular pattern formation, things can be quite different. And the basic point is, again, the sort of mechanisms used to study morphogenesis don't work in terms of the subcellular length and time scales. And there are two, three actually, three major differences found intracellularly compared to uh, morphogenesis. First, at least on the time scales relevant to pan formation, the reaction diffusion processes are mass conserving. Second, and this is uh, really interesting, I think, in many cases, what actually happens is that the, a molecule or set of molecules is continually being transferred between the cell membrane and the cytoplasm. The cell membrane diffusion is much slower than the cytoplasm, so it gives you a natural separation of time scales, which you want for robust pattern formation. And so what you end up, as shown in this figure, is due to spontaneous um, fluctuations, you can have a buildup of a protein on the membrane, and this buildup is maintained by a spatial uh, concentration gradient in the cytoplasm via diffusion. The total mass is conserved, but you end up with a spatially uh, varying distribution of uh, molecules in the cytoplasm and the membrane. And this is supposed to play an important role in many aspects of cell division and um, uh, cell division and um, what is the other one? Oh, cell polarization. The, sorry, the other aspect, which is something I've been working on recently, 
is that you can have molds in which you don't just have diffusion, but you also have active motor driven transport. And that's the last thing I want to briefly mention before I stop. So I, I, I don't want to get, I haven't got time to go into the that. What I want to talk about is this problem. So again, there's a lot I could talk about in terms of these different mechanisms, but let me talk about not this mass conserving problem, but a problem that was uh, outstanding since 1999, in fact. And this is observation, if you take C elements, and you look at a single uh, neurite or extension of a neuron in C elements along its cell body, you find this beautiful pattern of synaptic puncture distributed along the cell body. That's the first thing, which is crying out for a pan-forming mechanism of regularly spaced um, concentrations. And very interesting as well is as the C. elegans grows, new puncture inserted so that at late stage development, the density, the spacing between puncture is the same as early development. So this sounds like Turing pan formation on a growing domain. However, there's a twist. It turns out that the, from experiments, the main molecular players in this process are CAMK2, which is a kinase, and a receptor, a glutamate receptor, GLR1. But the twist is, although the CAMK2 diffuses in the cell, GLUR1 is trafficked by molecular motors. And so the question that we tried to address was, how could interactions between diffusing kinases and actively transported glutamate receptors lead to a Turing pattern? Now, I have to say that although it's, uh, there's a lot of evidence that these are the players, the details of the interactions is still not known. We've had to be a bit phenomenological here, but we want to at least try and see if a combination of diffusion and active motor transport could still support pattern formation. And so we came up with a model that basically said that let's imagine that glue R1 can switch between being moved to the right at a speed V and moved to the left at a speed minus V. And there's a lot of evidence for bidirectional transport in cells, whereas the CAMK2 diffuses. And we're not going to worry about the detailed mechanisms of how they interact. So that's missing from the model. And it, so it's phenomenological at this stage. We can write down a bunch of equations, just as you would in Turing, classical Turing instabilities. So the first equation would be our standard diffusion for an activator that interacts with the sum of the right moving and left moving uh, glutamate receptors. But now the glutamate receptors, either moving to the right or left, are being advected at a speed v. And so the difference is, although the first equation is your standard diffusion equation, the r plus and r minus are advected and again, they can switch between uh, right moving, left moving states, just as my cytonine could switch from growing phase to a retraction phase. Based on the, what's known about the uh, action of CAMK2 on glutamate, et cetera, a plausible but not proven uh, model for the chemical reactions is the classical guy and mind model, which I've just written down here. And so the question is, can this system lead to pattern formation? And in fact, and I hadn't realized when we first did this, that a, a nice way to see the, uh, the plausibility of this is to notice if I, for this particular model, it doesn't work for more general models, but for this particular model, if I just look at steady state equations and take the second two equations for R plus and R minus and rewrite them on the right hand side in terms of the flux J equals V R plus minus R minus, and the total concentration R, I end up with these steady state equations in which I can eliminate the flux completely. And lo and behold, I get the steady state equations for the classical guy and Meinhardt model. But we get out of this something that the effective diffusivity of the system is given by the speed squared over twice the switching rate, if we take value beta and alpha to be the same, plus one of the degradation rates of mu2. So at steady state, this system behaves the same as the guy Meinhardt model. But clearly, if I go to the full system and include time, when I linearize about a steady state, I'll get a different spectral problem. So one then has to investigate conditions for the occurrence of a Turing instability for the full model, which we did do, and we ended up being able to derive conditions 
for the emergence of spatial periodic patterns on a grain domain and using plausible values for the various parameters, not all of them are known, but ballpark figures, we could reproduce the sort of spacing you find, which is about three microns between neighboring puncta, and also show that you get insertion of patterns as the CODs grows, which was, uh, we thought was pretty cool. But there's one thing that I realized about a few weeks ago. If you look more closely at the patterns, they don't look like weak amplitude patterns. This system, like many other systems in pattern formation theory, operate in a highly nonlinear regime. And it turns out that there's been quite a lot of very interesting work studying um, solutions to these Gaia Meinhardt equations outside the weakly nonlinear regime using the theory of spike. You can use asymptotic analysis to prove existence and determine the stability of spike solutions to these equations. And so that's what I'm thinking about at the moment. Can I then do the same thing? Uh, again, the existence of spike solutions will be identical to the classical reaction diffusion model, but their stability will be a lot less, um, will be more complicated, so I've taken account of the that. Okay, well, I've wobbled on for way too long. I just wanted to give you, I rushed the last bit a bit, I apologize. I just want to give you a flavor that there's a lot of very interesting problems in pattern formation, both in terms of protein concentration gradients and spatially periodic patterns that are rich for new mathematics as well as a, a new model. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, if there are any questions, you can either um, ask them by unmuting yourself or you can ask them in the chat and I will try to find them and um, read them out. <laughs> <laughs> or everyone's gone to make their dinner. <laughs> you say tea in uh, Liverpool and Manchester. Yeah, I think in this region it's apparently tea. <laughs> yeah. People have gone off the say they said, if I see another equation involving first patchy stones, I'm going to scream. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, I oh, there's a question. a question. Hi, I'm Norman Kirk. I'm a chemical engineer, but I work down in the um, computational oncology group at the Christie Hospital. Right. And Paul, I found um, the early part of this talk, especially, um, extremely interesting. Um, okay. uh, my specific question would be uh, about what happens if a target um, varies its receptiveness to the um, cytosine that's, that's approaching it, and that the, the target is not um, uniformly receptive um, to the approaching payload. Um, because yeah. it seems to me that uh, in the way that you, you described it, that the steady state would exist and be stable. But as soon as the um, target could vary it, receptiveness almost infinitesimally it would destabilize the model and the, and the only um, attractors would be periodic or chaotic that's a good question yeah so I, I think this could be particularly relevant to applying these ideas to the COVID-19 or um, infections because there you have to take into account that uh, so, so part of that would be you have to take into account how infective is the uh, extension when it reaches the target cell and, and what you said how receptive is the target cell to being infected now uh, whether you end up with chaos or something like that you could uh, extend this model by modifying the boundary conditions because um, so one way you could try and address the thing you talked about is if you look at the uh, boundary conditions the way, uh, if I interpret your question correctly, is the way I've imposed it is to say, if you reach the target, it's 100% receptive and you're absorbed. Now you could modify that by having it a partially absorbing boundary condition, for example, and then repeat this analysis and see that how that affects things. So that would be um, one aspect of that. Whether, I, so I, I don't quite necessarily see that it wouldn't lead to some form of steady state, but, uh, I have no idea without doing the calculations. And another aspect of that, of course, is that in this simplified model, I assume that each packet is the same. Now, you can also have possibilities that packets have different amounts of loads. And that's another complication in terms of the uh, delivery. And in fact, you could think of how receptive 
uh, in a way, how receptive the target cell is, is another way of thinking about, well, how much stuff is in the uh, cytonine? Because if the target's not very receptive, it's like the cytonine not having much cargo. So I think there's a lot of interesting things in terms of having a variation in the amount of cargo delivered and changing the boundary conditions of what happens if a cytonine reaches a target cell. Does that make sense? Well, absolutely, yes, thank you. Okay. Oh, hi. <laughs> I it's think good to hear lots of English accents. I get very, I apologize, I know you've got a German accent over, but it's good to hear some English accents. Uh, if I hear another American accent, I'm going to scream. <laughs> unfortunately, my wife's, or not unfortunately, my wife's Italian, but my son was born in Salt Lake and he has a very strong American accent. When I was in Oxford for a few years, he completely switched to having a Harry Potter, very nice, much posher than me accent. And then he got back to the States, survival mechanism kicked in and he's got a very strong American accent. So anyway. So even if you just want to say something so I hear an English accent, that's fine. <laughs> If no one else is going to, I've got a question about the second part. Go on, yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, in, in the second part, where you've got a, a, a motor-driven process for um, yeah. transporting um, some of the molecules around, the, um, it occurs to me there that the, um, the, the, the transport that results from motor-driven is a, a sub-diffusion process. And, and you may know that in the maths department in University of Manchester, we have a, uh, we have a group that's very interested in sub-diffusion. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you've encountered him. Right, okay. Well, uh, on his behalf, um, could I ask about um, the, the effects of sub-diffusion in, in that motor-mediated um, transport process? Yeah, I, to be honest, I haven't thought about it. That's a good point. The, yeah. So, so one way to answer this, so uh, part of this, I think, is that I've grossly simplified things by just having two motor states. Now, in practice, you have multiple motor states. So first, uh, as I'm sure Sergey knows, that uh, you have situations where you have multiple motors attached to a cargo, some of which are uh, moving to the right and some to the left. So you have this sort of type of war. So you have multiple motor states, and some of these states could actually be stationary. And in fact, my intuition is that mo more likely is that interactions between the uh, diffusing molecule and the motor-driven molecule occur when the motor is in a stationary state. And the minute you start introducing a stationary state, it's a bit like introducing a sub-diffusive process. So I think by looking at a more detailed motor-based model, uh, and for example, having non-exponential transition rates between the different states would end up with a self-diffusive process along the lines that Sergey looks at a lot. Yeah. So there is another question from the audience. Um, should I just read that to you? Yeah, they're shy or they... So um, uh, Andrew Dean is asking, um, great talk, thank you. Is there an asymptotic limit of your cytonine-driven delivery that gives the classical diffusion limit or are they completely different mechanisms? They are completely different mechanisms. And in fact, that's borne out. Um, cytonines are very hard to experiment on because they're so thin. So... It, it, you know, as a mathematician, it's great because I can come up with anything and no one can say I'm wrong. <laughs> Since the ideal situation is clearly relevant to biology, but it's not sophisticated enough to prove me wrong. So, uh, so but, uh, which is, is nice. I know I shouldn't say that if I'm applying for grants, but anyway. But if you notice, if you look at this figure, it doesn't look like an exponential decay. Okay. And so it's clearly different from the diffusion limit. And, it, uh, and so you can get these sorts of decays if you have um, concentration dependent uh, absorption rates in uh, diffusion based morphogenesis. But just by looking at this figure, this is clearly not asymptotic to a simple diffusion process, is the answer to that question. Okay. Andrew, does that answer your question? Ah, oh, yeah, he says thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Raise his hand. Daniel Han raises his hand. <laughs> oh, yes. So, Daniel Han, would you like to ask your question? Yes. So, I, I was looking at with a lot of interest at your diffusion of with two, two states. 
fast diffusion and slow diffusion. Oh yeah. And I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. yeah. And I was wondering what kind of uh, motivating scenario would generate that kind of, I guess. So what's by, the that could produce that? By, right. Yeah. That's and also, would, if that were to happen, would it be a kind of continuous change of diffusion coefficient based on space and even possibly subdiffusion? Right. Yeah. So. Uh, so in answer to your question, so let's just take the actual uh, system, uh, the motivate, well, it didn't motivate this, it was a posteriori, but anyway, um, the thinking is that there's already a, a gradient, concentration gradient of other chemicals, and these chemicals buffer the uh, ones that switch diffusion. And so you've got a variation in the amount of buffering, which is continuous across the cell. And so the buffering is such that it's stronger on one side, which means it slows down the diffusion on one side, but is weak on the other. So that would suggest it's a continuous. And uh, so, uh, so a good question uh, related to what you asked is, one could think of this in two ways. You could say, well, D0 and D1, the two diffusions, rather than just being binary, they could be a continuum of diffusivities. The way we've modeled it is, is a continuum of the rates of switching between the two. Both would have the same effect, but yes, you're right. But uh, it looks like there is a continuum. And basically, there's a lot of interesting mathematics here that I haven't uh, gone into because for those of you who know about uh, stochastic processes, uh, you'll notice that the equation, this uh, differential or Wiener uh, process is what's called additive in that the diffusivity doesn't depend on the current position of the particle. When you go through the mathematical analysis, um, you end up with a diffusion, a uh, 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 stochastic differential equation, which is multiplicative. And as those of you who work in this game know, that the interpretation of the type of noise in Ito Stratanovich is uh, uh, quite subtle and non-trivial. In the case that we have looked at, it's uh, Ito. Sorry, this is a bit technical, but for those who don't know about these things. But we've shown in more general class of models, there can be actually a whole spectrum of different interpretations of the SDE depending on how you take limits. So for example, you can have a situation where you have colored noise and switching, and the nature of the, of the multiple of noise in the limit where you go from color to white noise and slow to fast switching, can, uh, it can be a wide range of different uh, interpretations of the SDE. So there's a lot of really cool stuff, and I haven't even thought about um, a, a subdiffusion yet, but I mean, there's a lot of interesting yeah, non-exponential switching with what, what happens would be very interesting to look at. Does okay. that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, no worries. So I don't see any further questions. So um, I think I will just um, use one of these clapping symbols. <laughs> 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 and uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for um, coming to Manchester, Liverpool, um, two places yeah. in Liverpool actually at the same time. Um, I would like um, to just um, close with um, announcing the talks um, in the next weeks. So um, our next talk will be um, already on next Monday. Uh, we will have uh, Dr. Edward Morrissey from Oxford. He will speak at 2 p.m. and he's actually hosted by Manchester. Um, the talk on Wednesday next week will be hosted by us, Dr. Merle Beer from uh, Berkeley. And um, two weeks ahead, we will have Dr. Bruno Martins and he will be hosted by the University of Liverpool. Um, thank you very much uh, to all of you for attending and uh, thanks a lot, Paul, for, um, yeah, <laughs> coming. Thanks. The worst thing is that I'd be dying to go down the pub for a pint, but there are two problems, COVID and I'm in Salt Lake City, but otherwise, <laughs> if any of you go to a socially distanced pub, have a pint on me, anyway. <laughs> <All right>. Me too. <laughs> okay, see you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Me. See you, bye.